morning. The uh, session now is about derivatives and systemic risk, which is clearly one of the main general concerns of any systemic risk manager. And uh, the papers we have today, I think, are a good, uh, a good uh, review of the, of the main issues about the area and the research questions. <clears throat> now, after the crisis, uh, there have been sort of two initiatives in terms of derivatives. The first one was to um, um, concentrate deliver derivatives clearing within CCPs. And that was a move that was inspired by the fact that when uh, the large broker dealers had balance books uh, of derivative transactions uh, within their balance sheets, they were running a business, effectively running a central counterparty business. However, they were running a central counterparty business alongside a number of other businesses, some of which were quite risky. And therefore, the central counterparty business was vulnerable to the riskiness of the other businesses that the large broker dealers were running. So the idea of the reform was to concentrate the running of the central counterparty business within specialized institutions which were set up only for that purpose and certainly, uh, and certainly uh, not affected by other kinds of risks in the financial system. And that was, I think, in my opinion, and certainly a very wise move, uh, which, however, raised some questions, which I'm sure that Mr. McLaughlin will discuss uh, uh, about, uh, and it was mentioned also before, the systemic role of central counterparties in this new world. And that's certainly a question that uh, we will have to talk about. The other fundamental pillar of the reforms after the crisis was the creation of the trade repositories. <clears throat> Why is that a fundamental pillar? It is because one characteristics, one feature of the financial system that the crisis has brought in broad light is the fact that authorities and systemic risk managers, which existed before the creation of the ESRB, and there were central banks before the ESRB, uh, turned out to be at a huge informational disadvantage relative to actors in the financial system and the financial system as a whole. And that is not what a systemic risk manager should be. The uh, role of a systemic risk manager is to have an informational advantage relative to everybody out there playing in the financial market. And so, uh, and so uh, the trade repositories were created. The papers that, uh, the other papers that we will, talk, uh, that we will hear about today in part, use data coming from those trade repositories, but in general, uh, provide analysis of the structure and the working of derivative markets, of different derivative markets. In one case, foreign exchange. In the other case, <coughs> credit. Now, they are, I think, very good examples of the state of knowledge of let's say a systemic risk manager, because this work has been done within the ESRB, of the state of knowledge of the uh, derivatives market, which I would deem is still uh, pretty preliminary at this point. We are able to map things in a very important way, but we still have a number of questions that need to be addressed and a number of really important investments, both in research and in systems that we need to carry out, because in order to handle the information that we gain from the uh, very uh, significant transactions that every day occur in the, in the financial systems in derivatives, 
we just need to set up a lot of, uh, of know-how and um, a lot of computers to deal <laughs> with that know-how and, um, and so on. In particular, one of the problems that are out there is that despite this important reform of trade repository, trade repositories, trade repository data is now far from being easily usable by systemic risk managers. So we need to really fill a gap uh, that has not been filled. And uh, I believe that some of the presentations today may touch upon this issue. I stop here with my uh, uh, initial remarks and I give the floor to Professor Howe uh, with his own presentation. Thank you very much. I just want to say one thing about your presentation, which is important for everybody to, uh, to uh, pay attention to. Uh, it is not only talks about uh, the uh, one uh, derivatives market from the perspective of risk, but also it talks about it from the perspective of efficiency. And that's a very important uh, sort of line to take, which I think people should take notice of. Good. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you, Alberto, for this introduction. So the title is Stop or Go, the Reform Agenda in OTC Derivative Markets. And my role will be to uh, speak about what the new data that EMEA and European uh, regulation provides us and what light this new data can shed on the reform agenda in uh, derivative markets. The results are somewhat preliminary, but I think uh, already this preliminary data has some, I think, very pertinent insights that I want to share with you. The work is uh, joined with Peter Hoffman and Sam Langfield, and the two of them have really done a tremendous and terrific work on, on making this data accessible, which is no small task given the amount and complexity of the issue. So uh, let me hop back with a little reminder of where this reform agenda in derivative markets came from. It's certainly true that derivative markets were not the origin of the 2008-2009 uh, crisis that was structured products. But at the same time, it's fair to say that derivative markets played a very important role in the transmission of the crisis. Um, people talk a lot about the Lehman disaster in uh, September 2008, but the real elephant in the room was AIG. And if AIG hadn't been saved, uh, the derivative exposure of virtually all the big banks would have brought them down. We would have had to nationalize every single uh, large uh, bank uh, in the global financial system. And AIG kind of um, preempted this. And, and in a way, the AIG um, nationalization was forced upon by uh, derivative exposure. So it's a very, it's the elephant in the room. It's a very important uh, issue, derivative reform, if you talk about systematic risk. Um, so the commitment was taken in Pittsburgh in 2009 to actually uh, progress on um, derivative reforms in three different dimensions. The first is the trade reporting that uh, Alberto mentioned, that the authorities should be put in a position there where they can actually make informed database judgments on, on the systematic risk that emanates from the derivative market. The second was the clearing uh, mandate, to move a large proportion of the clearable trades to uh, clearing houses. And the third is to change the market structure uh, so that these derivative uh, contracts could be traded more efficiently and would be then cheaper also to resolve and to aid with the uh, too big to fail problem and the resolvability of, of institutions. Uh, and maybe to make also the market more efficient. Um, so where we are in this reform agenda of uh, Pittsburgh uh, seven years later? Well, the results are very, very mixed, as you can see from this traffic light. Uh, we can distinguish reform in interest derivative, credit derivatives, FX derivatives, and we can put on the three different domains, the reporting uh, obligations. Uh, there we have made the biggest progress, uh, central clearing the um, results are very mixed and in exchange rate trading, I think uh, the, we, we haven't really made much progress, uh, or at least in Europe, not as much in the, as in the US. Um, in this talk, I will actually uh, focus on a particular sector, the FX derivative markets, where the progress has been um, 
least pronounced, uh, where we exec essentially on a red light the, the latest recommendations that emanate from the um, Paris-based ESMA board actually suggest that we should give up altogether on pre-trade reporting. And um, so I think going to exchange rate trading is a, a very far away. And uh, so we have a very important implementation shortfall with respect to the Pittsburgh agenda. And so my question is now, based on this new EMEA data, so we do in, in fact have the reporting. Now, what does this new data, what light can we shed on uh, the costs, the economic costs of this implementation shortfall. And here we can distinguish between two types of costs. The first cost is uh, continuing to running with the current OTC market structures, there are costs to this. There's some people that pay considerably more. Uh, we might have higher costs to risk management. Uh, these are costs that are borne possibly by the real economy. Uh, but these issues of market efficiency are probably less relevant from the systematic uh, kinds of risk concerns that we are talking about here. Uh, and um, so there's a second dimension to the question of implementation shortfall. What does the implementation shortfall really mean for how we think about systemic risk? And uh, here the question is, uh, given that we stick with this OTC structure, uh, what does it mean for the global risk allocation? Are the risks really borne by the institutions that should bear them? Generally, we view uh, important macroeconomic risks should be uh, borne by the best capitalized uh, institutions. Those are most cap capable of, of, of bearing these risks. And uh, what kind of consequences does the structure have for this macroeconomic risk allocation? The second issue that has to do with resolution and too big to fail. Obviously, if you have a lot of non-standardized um, trades that are on the books of these uh, large banks, uh, you kind of um, give up sort of implicitly on too big to fail and uh, there are costs to that as well. Um, Daryl Duffy always makes this point in his books that uh, the uh, um, resolvability of institutions and the nature of the contracts are obvi obviously highly uh, interrelated if you have a lot of OTC contracts that uh, augments resolution co costs tremendously and kind of forces public authorities into bailouts. So uh, let me talk about both issues. The first one is the more transactional perspective. And the second one is sort of the more global macro efficiency perspective on this implementation shortfall in derivative markets. And the good news is that uh, we are now in a position, I think, to take a more informed judgment on the costs of this implementation shortfall. And let me talk quickly about the data. So the data comes from these trade depositories that are mandated by, uh, by the new EMEA standards. It's very hard to work with this data. It takes a lot of technical capacity. It's big data. We have 20 billion observations of 100 variables. You can imagine the, the problems there. But I think the uh, European Systematic Risk Board did a tremendous effort here, um, thanks to people like Sam and Peter and others that, that worked on making this data accessible and exploitable for uh, scientific analysis. So um, we, in my talk, I want to focus here on a relatively short sample of a month, but still uh, tens of thousands of observations that spends FX derivatives, and we are actually looking at only at one uh, cross here, the dollar euro rate, the most liquid rate in a way, uh, for a one month period that involves roughly 170 banks and roughly 3,000 firms. We are focusing on the transactions between banks and so-called clients. These are corporates uh, um, in our sample. So, uh, the whole market, as you know, the OTC market has a core periphery structure. We have in the center of the trading network, of the bilateral trading network, uh, 16 big banks. And uh, then in the periphery, more to the periphery, other banks. And uh, at the very periphery, the, the uh, clients. And in this market where you don't have a central trading platform, there are considerable search costs, which raises the opportunity of having informational rents, because obviously someone who is in the center of the network trades a lot, uh, gets much more information, as opposed to just skimming off this information from a trading scheme screen where, where everyone is at an equal footing. Uh, so the OTC structure per se uh, creates a, a, a potential for 
considerable information rents. Um, so what are the main findings here? Um, what we find in the data is, uh, from a transactional point of view, three things. First of all, we find a high dispersion of spreads across clients. I mean, these are really enormous differences in the fairness of the market to different market participants. And uh, secondly, particularly unsophisticated clients, those that trade relatively little and that are uh, dealing only with one major dealer, um, and that are small, uh, these are the ones that pay enormous uh, spreads in this market. And maybe the more controversial point is the last one. We have average spreads that are overall high, I would say. Uh, so the first two are pretty undisputable. The second one is more a matter of appreciation. How do you compare the transaction costs to other markets? Now, on the issue of overall macroeconomic efficiency, uh, we find enormous concentration of trading revenue in a very small number of banks, dealer banks. So 85% of the profits or revenue go to a relatively small number of banks. Uh, moreover, this market is inherently, I guess, monopolistic in the sense that the more you trade, the more profitable you become per trade. So I'll show you some evidence on this. And finally, I think that's probably the most uh, pertinent remark for the for the issue of macroeconomic risk allocation, its optimality is uh, these dealer banks are pretty much all CIFIs and they're all, all highly leveraged institutions. So uh, from the macroeconomic uh, distributional point of risk, if you believe that at least a proportion of the risk is not passed on to ultimate clients, uh, well, we discovered this in structured products where we believed uh, all the risk was passed on to other market makers that could actually take the risk. Uh, uh, we don't really know how much of this risk is passed on, but to the extent that some of the counterparty risk, in particular uncleared risk, uh, stays with these banks, we have kind of the worst possible allocation of risk from a macroeconomic stability point of view. Uh, I come to, to, to this point at, at the end. So uh, let me skip this spread costs, come, come to the dispersion of spreads. So it's a very simple analytical framework. They're not the deep conceptual issues like with monetary policy. You just take the spread that everyone pays and you request it on a fixed effect for each client when you get the distribution of client costs. And you have this huge right tail that some, uh, some clients here on the, re on the right end of the, of the tail uh, pay very high spreads on average. By contrast, if you have fixed effects for banks, there's much less dispersion of, uh, of bank revenue across banks. Now, if you look at more detail, what are, these, what, are these what are these clients that actually pay huge spreads in this market? Uh, it correlates highly and convexly with the variable we can call inexperience or lack of client sophistication. And that's basically a composite of two things, uh, how small you are and how less diversified your interactions are with dealers. So basically, uh, clients that don't shop around that in principle always deal with the same dealer get a very, very bad deal in this market. And there has been a, a lot of talk in OTC market that we need them because of customization is important. If customization is important, we would expect it to be particularly important for clients that have a low credit rating. Because if you are already a fragile corporate, then, uh, then tailoring your derivative to your particular maturity that you need matters a lot. But surprisingly, we see none of it. We don't see that client risk is an important determinant of transaction costs, which is very surprising given this tailoring argument. Uh, tailoring, I mean, in the maturity dimension. Now, we can probably do a lot more to discard this argument of tailoring, which we haven't done yet, but, um, but a client risk not being related to trading costs is a very worrying uh, um, issue and sort of makes you think whether there's any substance to the tailoring argument uh, whatsoever in this market. Um, now, coming to client sophistication, we can do quantile regression. We can show more precisely how uh, trading cost actually increases with your size, namely inversely. The smaller you are, the, 
the bigger you, the more you pay, and the concentration of your counterparty. So the more you deal with one uh, counterparty with a single uh, dealer, the more you pay. Of course, that's endogenous. It's sort of indicative of of trading costs, but those of uh, search costs, those that have high search costs, uh, they get very disadvantaged in this market. Now, let me come to the third issue of the transactional aspect. How, how big are the overall costs to this? Uh, that's a bit of a more touchy issue. It depends a little bit how you normalize trading costs. If you uh, take the average spread of maybe 25 basis points here in this market, how does this compare to other markets? Let's say the equity market where spreads in absolute terms are maybe similar or somewhat smaller. Well, if you think that the notional that is actually transferred is only 5% of uh, the total value transferred, you would conclude that this market is by a factor of 25 bigger the trading costs 25 times bigger than in equity trading. Well, that might not be the right normalization. If you want to normalize with carry risk, for example, still you get relatively excessive costs. Carry risk in FX is smaller than in equity, and still you have higher absolute costs here. So it depends on the normalization. There, there, there is a study here by the Deutsche Börse that we put in here that roughly eight estimates that the trading cost to this OTC structure for a client might be up to eight times what it could be in OTC. I don't want to push the factor of eight or any particular factor, but I think the academic research shows that moving to OTC structures uh, can substantially decrease uh, trading costs. Already, uh, pre-trade transparencies does a lot. We have this experience from the municipal bond market and the experience in corporate bonds where, um, where um, trades and other pre-trade transparency mechanisms led to a substantial decrease in spreads. So I think um, from a scientific point of view and our experience in other markets suggest that uh, this is a relatively expensive and inefficient market for clients. Now, um, this, the total, we can also calculate what's the total cost uh, of revenue that is generated here for the dealer banks, we come up with a 3.2 billion number. Uh, remind that this is sort of concentrated on export firms. So these are the ones that actually have to pay these costs. And uh, so it's kind of like a, a, a substantial trade tax on those firms that have to hedge their, their risk. It might even uh, impede some uh, type of corporate risk hedging if you believe that your costs are exorbitant, you might not do it. Uh, and um, so maybe liquidity is actually lower in this market as it should be from the demand side because of the cost. Uh, but we have no, no concrete evidence on this yet. I think it's, it's worthwhile uh, looking more into the real effects of, of this OTC structure, which we haven't done yet. On the other hand, on the um, dealer bank side, uh, revenue is highly concentrated. Huh? So uh, the distribution shows very, shows very sort of um, right tilted. Uh, and uh, given that this is an important sector, that makes these banks bigger and, uh, and uh, certainly reinforces the too big to fail problem there. Here's the picture that plots trading uh, revenue per trade per unit of trade as a function of how big you are. And you see a convex line here relative to the 45 degree line. So this market, the bigger you are, the more profitable you are in a way per unit of trading. Oh? So there's a natural kind of monopolistic or oligopolistic structure to this market from an IO point of view. And we wouldn't believe that this market therefore would um, evolve towards less concentration no? because the economies of scale here. This is just the revenue side. There's also a cost side. Uh, which probably reinforces this further. If you're bigger, you might have cost savings. But already from the revenue side, you have to have economies of scale in this market. Um, OK, so uh, let me come to the last point of the issue of how do we look at this market from the systemic point of view? Uh, what is the vulnerability? I think uh, yesterday um, we, it was said we have to focus, I mean, John, Cunliffe uh, emphasized this notion of resilience. Resilience is supported. Do we have a resilience structure here? Well, uh, think about the overlap. Uh, we have here the, I think these are just 13 global 
systematically important banks, uh, CIFIs, and they share 75% of the market share in this market. And uh, these are also the same institution that have the highest leverage. So uh, I guess from a systemic point of view, we would say this is sort of the powder, powder keg of the financial system. So if one of these sort of is hit, uh, I think we have an explosion. It's like, like the Royal Navy in World War I going out to sea into the battle with the, with the door to the ammunition chamber open. No? And first hit, the whole thing blows up. So I think from a, from a distributional point of view, this is the worst possible risk allocation that we can have. Um, uh, one interesting question is, of course, uh, the issue of contestability. Why isn't it that other people come in and contest this market? And of course, given that you have such a high concentration of profit, this industry is probably also very organized in terms of lobbying and defending these rents. And um, I think there's also considerable coordination problems on the part of the buy side. Uh, these are a dispersed group of 3,000 corporate firms. Uh, they would have to coordinate to all come to the market to a new uh, exchange at the same point. So it has been tried apparently repeatedly by, the, by some exchanges to actually dislodge this market, but given the structure of it, it might be very hard without, I would call a, a regulatory nudge that you kind of um, uh, employ some force in, in, in transferring this to a more efficient market structure. So, um, good. Um, uh, of course, the important issues that we don't really know, and that goes to the uh, presentation that will follow by Thomas, we don't have a clear view yet, and this research doesn't do it, how much compression is going on there, how much transfer of the risk to ultimate institution that should carry these risks uh, is going on. And um, uh, so these questions are very fundamental for, uh, for uh, judging how explosive the situation actually is. Okay, that's a bit outside the scope of what we did so far. So let me uh, come to a conclusion here. What does this uh, new EMEA data tell us about this market? Well, it's a very costly market. It's a costly market for the expert sector, in particular for unsophisticated firms. So I guess from an efficiency transactional point of view, there's a point to be made here for reforming this market. I think so far, most of the academic research that has been done on similar reforms, OTC market reform in municipal bonds and bond markets show that there are substantial cost reductions available here for um, client. It's also clear that it entrenches too big to fail um, by preventing non-banks from entering. Uh, in equity, for example, a lot, a lot of the Intermediation is done by the retail sector today. Huh? I mean, if you look at equities, uh, that's a very stable and very uh, reliable source of liquidity, which doesn't play a role at, at all. And if we would transfer the OTC structure into an exchange rate structure, that's what we would get. We would get a lot of other participants into the market and uh, so get at a very much better risk distribution of the, uh, among intermediaries uh, this way. Okay, finally, as I said, we, we have a very undesirable macroeconomic allocation here of risks in the, in the very institutions that are least capable of, of taking over this risk. I think that's pretty much what I wanted to say. Uh, so, huh? last picture, yeah. So, I think there's also, I mean, the question then comes, of course, why didn't, why, why did we switch to red light here? I mean, that's a very good, maybe someone from ESMA or the European Commission can answer this question. Why did they stop derivative reform in, in this market, which is such an obvious candidate for moving to exchange rate market? That's a very good question, and I think something that the systematic risk board should probably take up, and uh, I can only speculate since I'm not very familiar with the, with the particular process uh, there. I, I would however, stress that it poses an important credibility issue. I think if we plow the, the big fruits here from derivative reform and the substantial improvement of systemic stability that we, we get out of this by not doing this, I think we have a considerable loss of credibility you know, uh, if we stay with Stowe. So in a way, my, my um, talk here is also a plea for reconsidering uh, the ESMA and commission decision on, on putting 
uh, a red light on derivative reform here, because otherwise we face a tremendous cost of credibility here, and that's captured by this cartoon. Let me finish here. Okay. Thanks. The, um, it seems to me that the natural quest, uh, answer to your question about the FX market is that, you know, FX forwards are not very different from an FX spot market. It's just that a settlement is delayed. And people will say that the FX market has been working like this OTC for decades, more than decades, very well. So the, this is the, this, the standard industry response. But of course, you're raising important questions that need to be uh, thought about. Now, in terms of uh, the concentration, again, it's a fact of life of derivatives dealership that these markets are always concentrated. And again, it's an interesting regularity. We need to understand a bit more, maybe from an industrial organization perspective, why is that so? But, but it wouldn't um, be if we moved to, to another market structure. That's sort of the point. It probably wouldn't be. And the question is how to do it. But we now move to a different set of questions. Mr. McLaughlin, uh, on uh, CCPs. Whatever you prefer. Yeah. You want to sit down? Yeah. Sit down, it's fine. We need the hope. Come on. There are more issues. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, I'm going to try and talk a little bit about probably where the biggest culprit in the um, in the debate. Um, LCH is probably the glo uh, the biggest global derivative CCP out there right now. And just a few uh, statistics: uh, we have about 90% of the interest rate swaps market, which uncompressed is over 500 trillion dollars in-house. Uh, compressed, it's in the low 200s. Um, and obviously, the business keeps coming in. Um, we are also in the repo market. In Europe, we have about two-thirds of cleared repos. Um, we are also in the FX market, FX forwards, non-deliverable forwards, although that is not um, mandated as yet to be cleared. Uh, we are also in the uh, CDS market. We have probably about 20% and growing in that market. And then we're in, they were all pure derivatives, if you view repo as a derivative. Um, we are also in um, the more traditional physically settled markets linked to exchanges like equities and commodities and um, bonds, yeah. Um, uh, interest rate, um, futures, things like that. So we have a mix of mostly derivatives, I would say, but also the more traditional physically settled products. And just a few words before I launch into the evolution of the markets. <laughs> but um, traditionally, the CCP is there to act as a shock absorber against the impact of a member default. So we, um, in the CCP, we collect margin to ensure that once a defaulted member, once a member defaults, we can step in, we have enough margin to ensure that the VM obligations to the non-defaulted members are met. Then we take the defaulted member's portfolio, we actually uh, assume ownership of that portfolio, and we close out that portfolio in the market. If it's a traditional exchange-traded uh, instrument. We use brokers to access the liquidity on the exchange. If it's a more um, derivatives-like uh, position, we have to auction that off and use the membership to spread out the positions in that auction. Or we can go to people outside the membership, which tend to be large banks, to more buy-side institutions to try and, and move those portfolios. The process follows a very, very strict protocol that's pre-agreed with the members up front. This is what we're going to do. This is the steps we're going to take. Um, the oversight of that is obviously the CCP is looking at it, but also um, members 
um, give up uh, traders to sit on a, what's called the default management group to, um, to help administer the um, closing out of the defaulted portfolio. And so this is the theory anyway. It serves to limit the potential contagion in the default event. That's how a CCP traditionally works. That's how we've traditionally worked. Um, and I will talk a little bit more about what needs to happen now because that's, I would say, under strain right now from various things that are happening. Um, the key systemic risk tools that we use to try and, um, as I said, the numbers are quite staggering. Um, so we have to be quite um, careful about, uh, first of all, who do we let into the CCP as a member, an active member. Um, we have to have very sharp minimum credit standards. So for example, we do not allow subprime members to join the CCP. You cannot join the CCP if you're a subprime equivalent. Um, that's not universal, but that's our standard because it's hard to justify the contagion of the CCP pool, if you like, the mutualized pot with a subprime sub member. Obviously, there's the cover two standard, which puts a floor, if you like, on the kind of financial resources we must hold to ensure that um, there's enough financial resources to withstand the instantaneous default of the largest two members. Um, but if you think about the trading mandates, uh, the clearing mandates that have come into place, it's quite hard to manage the concentration risk. Um, the, all we can do, because we can't say no, they have to clear, uh, all we can do is continue to charge more and more financial resources, exponentially increasing the financial resources until such a time as the trading, if we feel it's too big, it's starting to be discouraged. Um, so that's really difficult to do. Um, we have a process for doing it, and the way we do it is we, um, we demand a fairness principle that no one member can take up more than half of the default fund because that's the mutualized pot, so one member should not overuse that, if you like, or take too advantage of the other members. And the extent to which they do go over that 50%, we charge additional margin to bring that total resources required for the default uh, to cover the default of the largest person, the share to of the mutual to everybody? Each individual member to the, yeah. um, is required to stay below that uh, limit, if you like, of 50% of the default fund. The other uh, thing we have to look very carefully at is procyclicality, which I know is a huge issue for systemic risk management. Here we have our own standard, which um, we felt that the ESMA constraints, the ESMA standards were not strong enough. Uh, and what we've done is we've looked at um, the credit cycle, so to speak, probably going back 10 years. And we have a standard in place that demands that if we were to evolve the past into the future, over the next uh, 10 or so years, there should not be any one day. The model should be built so there would, be, there would be no one day in that future where the margins for a member would jump more than 25% in the, um, over the holding period. Um, that's a very interesting standard. And we have, uh, we run our models to that standard. The only exceptions that we've noticed in that standard are due to central bank or government actions, which is a very interesting finding from our perspective, where the source of systemic risk comes from. Okay, the last part is on actual default management. We are, of course, are managing to a cover two standard. What happens, what's the safeguard, if you like, or what's the fire escape if more than two people default? Well, then we have assessment powers built into our rule books um, where we can actually call a number of new assessments from members if we need those resources. Um, we have variation margin gains haircutting tools. And we have, and I put partial in, in brackets here, contract tear-ups. The full partial contract tear-up is a very, very difficult issue for us because we would love to be able to, in derivatives markets anyway, it's unclear exactly how you objectively upfront specify the trades that you would tear up. It's very, very difficult. 
especially in a, a derivatives market where you have so many trades offsetting so many others, um, it's very hard to identify exactly those trades you would tear up. That's much easier to do in more traditional physically settled markets where the culprit's very easy to identify. Now, the, one of the big topics right now for discussion um, is the, these powers have obviously systemic consequences. Tearing up a member is, has all sorts of knock-on effects or could have knock-on effects. And therefore, we have to be very, very careful about exactly under what circumstances we do this. And this is part of a resolution and recovery uh, work stream that's going on right now run by the FSB to really nail this down. So that's sort of a, that's where we are today and kind of what we're doing. Um, I think things are moving on rapidly because as I mentioned, um, the size of the numbers are quite, quite large. The, um, also there's a couple of things that have emerged um, as new uh, developments here. Uh, the first one is um, the capacity of banks to provide clearing or of members to provide clearing services outside banks is declining. So anybody who wants to see this can look at the number of FCMs there have been and how that population has shrank dramatically in the last couple of years due to things like SLR constraints, regulatory constraints, uh, capital constraints, etc., are making it more and more unprofitable. And that means that um, uh, third party users are outside the core banking sector, well, they don't right now have access to the CCP. They're finding it very, very difficult to get clearing uh, services from the core banking structure. So that's a very, very interesting development because now we're under enormous pressure to try and extend our membership beyond core banks, if you like, to insurance companies, pension funds, investment managers, all these kind of institutions. That creates enormous headaches for us because obviously they don't have the same link into the financial banking system and the, and the uh, European system, for example, that um, banks would have. So it's a bit of a headache and we haven't figured it out yet. But the other surprising uh, development that's happening is that central banks are now looking to, and have actually joined the CCP as a fully fledged member. Now, if you think of the implications of that, a central bank could be borrowing enormous sums of money or lending enormous sums of money. That's the kind of uh, activity we're seeing today and trying to parse out what the risks are that they're bringing into the clearinghouse and if you like polluting the default fund, the mutualized fund is quite, quite interesting. Um, some of them, um, a huge debate about whether they should be paying uh, into that mutualized fund or not. So, this is not easy. Um, probably the biggest challenge I think that I face in the CCP is, and this was unseen at the time, uh, obviously that uh, in, in Pittsburgh when this was all put into place, what exactly would actually grow up at the end state when you've done all this and then you see what has grown up? Well, I think we're the poster child for what's grown up and so we begin to see constraints that we had no idea that were out there. And the one I really feel for is the, um, the, it creates enormous problems for me, is the, the fact that we have to take margins off, off our members, obviously, because that's how we, how we protect ourselves. But those margins have to be stored somewhere. And under the conflicting regulations by various different bodies, they're all in conflict. Because on the one hand, and they all make very, much, very good sense on an individual basis, but when you put them together, they don't. So, for example, um, Emir says that no more than 5% on average of your margins should be invested unsecured. And I totally see that. That's a really good policy. Um, on the other hand, so you're not allowed to use money market funds either. Okay. Uh, so what do you do then? Well, you would say we'd put it in the central bank. Well, that'd be a good place if you had access to the central bank for every currency that you're dealing in. But we don't. We, um, we have 17 currencies globally, at least 17, and um, we have central bank access for deposits in some of these um, relevant currencies, but not in others. 
So then what that forces you to do in a stress event is that you have an enormous inflow of variation margin, call, uh, sorry, VM calls coming into you, full of cash, and you have nowhere to put the cash. So you're kind of defaulting, if you like, the fire escape is the only thing left is to leave it with a commercial bank. And that's certainly not a good place to be in a stress event. These days. Yeah. So this is the one, of, one of the biggest challenges I see where each individual regulation makes a lot of sense, but the overall consequence of that is not making sense at all. Um, other uh, things that we're seeing, I mentioned the traditional focus on the clearing members totally changing. Um, the, the focus, if you like, on the old mission of the clearinghouse for managing clearing member defaults is out of date, totally out of date. Because if you think about the structure that's been set up is we have a rule book and rule book powers which totally allocate the losses um, from a clearing member default. They totally allocate it, although you might be worried about the systemic risk powers, which we can get to later, but they totally allocate the losses due to a member clearing member default. But there can be other losses, many, many other losses, and there's a paper that I wrote on this a couple of um, months or so ago that came out, um, which there are probably eight or nine categories of losses, of which this is one. And for the other categories of losses, it's not so clear what you would do because Many of them cannot be allocated back to members, in which case the only thing you can try and do is absorb the ca um, through the CCP capital, absorb the losses that way. So each one of those losses have to be addressed individually and um, new, if you like, rules put in place for how you would actually either allocate it back to the members or absorb it or deal with it so through some kind of new rule book power. And there are many examples, and uh, this is an ongoing debate, probably the biggest debate right now going on in um, the resolution and recovery work stream for the FSB. One consequence of this is that these losses that cannot be covered by member margins in traditional rule books, um, they tend to, a lot of them tend to arise in operational risk kind of events. And hence the operational risk discipline, which was only a few a paragraph or so in a mirror is greatly expanded now. We've had to work very, very hard to find out, well, what are all the kind of things that can happen, the operational risk events that can happen at a CCP, and what controls do we have in place? That's a very big issue for us. The other really big issue is that the key CCP relationships in the financial ecosystem are not well understood. I just gave you an example of the interaction with the repo markets very, very good sense to control the repo markets from one, one aspect, shadow banks, et cetera. But there's a very unintended consequence of giving the CCP a, a difficulty in actually storing the margins in a safe manner. So you have two conflicting uh, things going on there. Um, as I said, we have interactions with central banks which are becoming very, very complex, <laughs> to say the least, and we're not envisioned uh, at the time of the Pittsburgh summit. Um, there are other people looking to join as well. <laughs> and there's a whole list of them. Um, obviously, hedge funds are at one extreme, central banks are at another, but there's a whole spectrum in between. Um, I would say that the other interesting thing about central banks is that when, when an action takes place, for example, quantitative easing, announcement of quantitative easing, that has an enormous impact on the CCP because momentarily we're unbalanced. Our margins suddenly are completely off. And so if a member was to default at exactly that time, we would not have enough margins. So there's, there's interesting, if you like, and, and central bankers are becoming aware of this obviously, but um, I would say more slowly rather than more quickly. Um, and I would just say one more thing is that the there's a huge difference between um, asking for a deposit account at a central bank for the reasons I laid out versus asking for a repo facility at a central bank, and that's not always understood. In the public mind, it's been equated with a bailout, even if you just need the deposit facility. And that's, there's absolutely no credit risk to the CCP there, and there's a very good reason for asking for that. And then the CCP recovery and resolution, just to 
um, bring it to an end. The, some of the big open issues are, who is the resolution authority for a CCP? I only found out just before Christmas that in the US it was the FDIC. That was a surprise to a lot of people. Well, it was a surprise. There was a room full of um, banks and CCPs. We were shocked <laughs> because they hadn't been in the discussion up until that point. And the other, the other one is, um, what is the relationship to the CCP regulator? Because um, in some cases, they're the same. The regulator and the resolution authority are the same. In other cases, they're not. Yeah, not in the U.S. And um, the thing about that is the concern across when you cross borders internationally, it's quite a little, it's quite a uh, a problem because we we are systemically important in many many countries. Well, at least five, uh, not in one where you have a domestic uh, view, if you like, and there are transactions taking place on a venue in that country. You can. Uh, have regulations in the infrastructure and the e ecosystem in that country to, to look after that. But when you're systemically important in several countries, then it becomes a question of, well, exactly how does this work? So I, I won't go into that just to say that it, it's cr creating a bit of a headache. And the final point is, um, when should the CCP be put into resolution? That is not at all clear. If it happens too early, if it's mandated to happen too early, you might skew the incentives and not um, drive people to try and explore all the recovery avenues that they can before you put them in resolution. So it, it can be a little bit strange. So that's probably the biggest open question that we have right now. And then finally, I think there's a role for the ESRB in all this because this um, issue I raised about um, Everybody in their own little silo acting for the, to the good and to legislate, uh, legislation that makes sense. But overall, when you put them together, they have very, very strange uh, consequences. That, I think, is a role for a systemic body like the ESRB to try and ensure that we're all singing off the same hymn sheet. One thing I would uh, say, though, when, when activities do take place to try and um, address these issues, that we remember that the CCP itself is, right now it's a private entity because a taxpayer-funded solution is off the table. So if it's a private entity, it has to make a cost of equity. And it's not a bottomless pit. So more and more drives to increase capital will de degrade that uh, return on equity. And eventually, private sector funding won't flow into the CCP unless the cost of clearing increases dramatically. So I'll just leave you with that thought. Thank you very much. Just a clarifying uh, question. You mentioned uh, an increased reluctance of uh, banks to perform the clearing member role vis-a-vis -vis clients, mm -hmm. but isn't there an issue, a concern on their part of, of being disintermediated if you allow <coughs> direct access by um, other actors to the CCP? Is, have you not observed that? Absolutely right, yeah, and there, obviously, banks have to defend that, um, the role of intermediary. But on the other hand, the buy side are finding it increasingly difficult to actually complete these transactions, so there's a trade-off. Okay. All right, thank you very much, I appreciate that. Uh, we move to Tuomas now. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Thomas Pelden, the deputy head of the ESRP Secretariat. I'm very delighted to speak to this uh, distinguished audience. Um, let me talk about uh, our ongoing work on analyzing credit derivatives markets, the flow of risk, notional excess, and portfolio compression. Let me thank here my colleagues, particularly Marco De Rica, Tarik Rogni Ornia, and Sam Langfield, who have helped me to, to prepare this presentation. And finally, um, uh, as a disclaimer, I'm talking here about my own views and not necessarily those of the, of the ESRB and its member institutions. We already heard some, some facts about the role of the global financial crisis of revealing the, the size and opacity of the OTC derivatives markets. 
and also the G20 reforms, the Pittsburgh summit, uh, that basically aimed at reforming the OTC derivatives markets, making them safer and more transparent. What we learned also that uh, we have a very large notional amounts uh, in place. Uh, depending on the on the different statistics you use, you get a bit uh, different numbers. But here we use the BIS 2015 numbers that the uh, interest rate derivatives are roughly 384 uh, trillion, the CDS 12, and so forth. What we also know is that there is quite uh, some heterogeneity, and in some uh, derivative cases, also complexity of the instruments. But the key key point that Harald also already referred is that there is a very large fraction of intra-financial exposures. So uh, there has been considerable efforts at the EU to increase transparency and order in, in the derivatives markets. The EMI regulation is a founding uh, building block on, in, in this respect. And uh, uh, here at the ESRP, what we have uh, tried to do is uh, uh, to exploit the, the, the uh, enhanced reporting of derivatives uh, transactions to the trade repositories. So the EMIR requires all EU counterparties to report their derivative exposures to the trade repositories. We have a double uh, reporting, and we include all derivatives, so also the uh, exchange traded derivatives are, are reported. And what our work at the ESRP Secretariat has been focused on is to basically develop uh, a credible uh, data infrastructure, uh, also to work with our colleagues at the European Commission and ESMA to contribute to improve the data quality, and then uh, conduct policy-relevant analysis. So Harad was uh, showcasing you one, one ongoing work, and I'm, I'm doing a, a showcase for, for a couple of others. Uh, by doing uh, uh, this work, what we have done, basically, we have looked at the sky, and got trying to get some motivation for, for the work. So I'm showing you here the NASA uh, dark matter map of the galaxy cluster Hubble. And why this is relevant, uh, it actually uh, has quite some many um, connections to the, to the derivatives markets. First of all, as Harald was mentioning, uh, the EMIR data is expanding every business day. So it's like space, which is sort of expanding uh, in, its, uh, in its way. According the, the, to one theory. Uh, according to one theory, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's a mainstream uh, theory for, for this respect. We, we the also... The <laughs> <laughs> exactly. There is a second, second uh, factor which, uh, which is similar to the, to the space science, is that you, you, you pretty much need to be a rocket scientist to be, to be able to work on this data set. So it's, it's a complex data set, it's a huge data set. You need to basically be able to to put in order in that before you can do analysis. And finally, uh, like the dark matter here, uh, the EMIR data is, is, is like that, basically. So it's sucking you in and you can't get out. So, so uh, once you start working on it, you, you basically have to continue. So um, actually yesterday, what we, what we did uh, was that uh, we published in our website uh, an occasional paper number 11, which is getting some inspiration from this dark matter and, uh, and other academic research, actually. Uh, uh, and it's titled Shedding Light on Dark Mat uh, Markets. And this, this work uh, actually is our first uh, publication regarding the, the, the works of regarding EMIR data. It focuses on three market segments of derivatives at the interest rate uh, markets, credit derivatives, and FX derivatives. And we already can conclude from, from that work that um, the EMIR data, despite of all, all the debate, can already provide uh, useful insights. Clearly, uh, there are data quality issues that should be addressed and, and can be improved. But already now, we can already uh, get some useful insights for the policy. What uh, also Harald referred to, we, we have observed that there is indeed a very high level of intra-financial exposures especially the intra-dealer exposure, the G16 dealer exposures that were referred. Moreover, what we have also observed in the EMIR data, and, and, and it's highlighted here in the occasional paper, that the market structure, uh, and the network of trades and exposures, is already reflecting these uh, key regulatory and other changes 
so the central clearing applications and compression and so forth. So I, I recommend all of you to, to go and, and look this paper. Today I will focus on, on the two concepts, the flow of risk. So I will, I will explain you the, the concept, which is basically the method uh, uh, to track transfer of risks. Uh, I will show you uh, one, one chart of um, what we have done using this methodology to uh, map the global CDS network using a global uh, DTCC data. And I will also show you some uh, examples of ongoing analysis using the EMIR data, so the European part of the derivatives markets, on uh, geography of risk flows, as well as potential ways to look, for instance, wrong way risk. The second concept relates to the portfolio compression. I will explain you what is it all about. It's basically a post-trade technique aiming at reducing the cross-notional uh, amounts, which are very large, as, as we know while keeping the notional uh, exposures unchanged. And then uh, opening basically some uh, further research for, for impl this implications of the portfolio compression. So just to give you a quick overview of the uh, uh, OTC uh, credit derivatives markets, and here focusing on the single name CDSs, and this is basically an excerpt from the uh, occasional paper, a table using data as of November 2015. And what you can see from this table is clearly that the OTC uh, credit derivatives markets are uh, mainly between the G16 dealers, between banks, and other financial institutions than insurance uh, corporations and pension funds. But what is uh, also interesting here to look is that the role of non-financial firms in hedging basically credit exposures seems to be relatively small in this uh, total amounts of trades. Uh, I will uh, explain you the flow of risk concept. So you will see here um, a bow tie uh, chart which illustrates how, how risks uh, are transferred in the, in the CDS market. So um, you can see basically in this chart that from going from the left to the right that the underlying credit risk which is being traded in the CDS is ultimately transferred from the ultimate risk sellers on the left in green through the strongly connected component of dealers to the ultimate risk buyers. So the ultimate risk buyers are actually those who sell the CDS protection, and the ultimate risk sellers are those who buy the, uh, buy the uh, protection. And what uh, you observe here is that there is a closed intermediation chain in between transferring this risk. Of course, this flow of uh, all, all, uh, underlying credit risk introduces uh, a counterparty risks which move from right to the left, so the opposite direction. So what are the uh, examples of relevant policy questions that can be uh, analyzed using this flow of risk approach? So for instance, we can use it to uh, map the geography of risk flows, for instance, cross-border exposures, exposures to different type of entities, and so forth. We can also, uh, when combining the EMIR data with other data sources, we, we can try to also make, uh, to understand actually why these uh, derivative exposures are used. So why, why uh, certain counterparties enter into this, whether it's hedging, gaining uh, synthetic exposures or so forth. Uh, and we can also understand an important element which played a role uh, uh, also in the, in the past crisis is the, the concept of wrong way risk, where basically the probability of default of the CDS protection seller is correlated highly with the underlying credit risk. As promised, uh, this chart maps you the uh, global CDS network. It's, it's a one part. So this highlights really the complexity of the, of the derivatives markets. I'm, I'm showing you here one uh, uh, flow of risk chart uh, at, in one day at the time in, in March 2011 for one major sovereign uh, underlying CDS. Uh, naturally, the, the, the markets are very complex. So in, in, in the CDS market uh, alone, as mentioned, this, this, uh, this market uh, continues to trade every business day of the week, 
and it trades off hundreds of different underlying entities. Uh, and of course, when one wants to really map the, the, the whole network, one has to put this into the multi-layer network uh, context and then do it in dynamic fashion. Here I'm showing you a, a one snapshot of this uh, uh, global network. So it actually includes all uh, derivatives uh, that are in, in this major sovereign in the world. The DTCC is a, is a main, trade re, uh, main trade repository globally uh, for, the, for the CDS market and uh, accounts uh, more than 90, I think 99% of the, of the trades. So here what we can see clearly that there is a, a change of the, basically the, the flow of risk happens here. So the credit risk is being intermediated in the center. It goes from, from different types of entities on the left to the right or, or different entities. What we can observe here is that the ultimate risk buyers, so those two who are the sellers of the CDS on the right hand side chart are, are asset managers, banks and hedge funds. And as I mentioned, the counterparty risk goes to the other, uh, other direction. What is interesting here is that uh, when we look not the absolute core of this, the centerpiece, but look a bit the outer circle, we also see some non-bank intermediaries. And of course, uh, from from risk analysis perspective, it's important to understand, uh, you know, how they are being supervised and what 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 are their connections to the to the other financial institutions. The size of the circles. Mention the size of the circles. They, they are basically the exposures. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. important. Yeah, sure. So, sorry. <laughs> so here here um, uh, now turning from the global uh, CDS market to the European market. Uh, we, are, we are again analyzing a one particular sovereign. Clearly, I'm, I'm not going to tell you which sovereign this is and, and who are the, uh, the, the institutions in this map. But what I want to just highlight you is that here uh, we can basically look uh, again in, in this one snapshot who are at the end of the day the ultimate risk buyers and sellers and who are intermediating in the center, what type of institutions they are. Uh, and what is actually uh, further uh, use of this is to look not only the type of the counterparties, but also where this counterparty resides, and then mapping basically whether the counterpart, the, the underlying credit risk, is correlated with the residence of the of the counterparty who is selling the protection. So in this chart, you would see that basically the red dots on the right hand side are actually in the same location, which is basically the, the underlying credit risk that is being hedged. So there is potentially a presence of wrong way risk. Um, whereas in this chart, which is an, another sovereign, we don't see this, this happening. So uh, what are the, let's say, the open questions and further uh, research avenues? Uh, clearly, uh, we are uh, working hard on this, but as I mentioned, you need a lot of rocket scientists around to be able to work on this. Resources are constrained and so forth. But what we are really trying to do is to uh, map basically the portfolio and counterparty overlaps of, of different market participants between different types of derivatives and underlying entities. So this is one important factor for risk monitoring. Then understanding the dynamics of this network and develop different monitoring tools such that Francesco and I basically can just open the, the, the tool and, and see, okay, how the risk is going. So I know that uh, Alberto likes to use the word of risk uh, manager. So this would be actually this type of tools that would allow the risk manager to easily observe developments in the in the markets because they, they are very complex. You cannot open a 20 million billion observations. You have to have a visualization tools, other tools. We also want to understand uh, the role of the CCPs and, and how the network structure is changing because of the central clearing. Understanding also the motives of, of different uh, entities using the, the markets. Mapping this with other data sources and then one very important factor still to be analyzed further is actually the economic role. It was a bit referred in Harald's uh, presentation of these very large interfinancial positions. And also if an if, um, uh, issue which is very pertinent and important is the collateral flows and the reuse of, of collateral. Um, 
turning to the second topic of, of the talk here, um, uh, which relates to portfolio compression, you will see basically the uh, paragraph from the MIFID regulation explaining this what, what basically is portfolio compression. But just to uh, summarize it in a nutshell, it's a, it's a post-trade operation that reduces the cross amount uh, in, in the market basically without affecting the, the market participants' net uh, positions. This uh, portfolio compression is actually a significant issue. Uh, multiple uh, derivatives are being compressed, interest rate uh, swaps, cleared and uncleared, CDSs, single names, uh, and index products, also FX, commodity swaps, inflation swaps, all kinds of derivatives. According to Trioptimum, which is one large uh, uh, private entity providing multilateral uh, uh, portfolio compression, reports that they have compressed 840 trillion of OTC derivatives. Uh, the notional has been eliminated in this you know, trade compressions until 2016. I actually don't know when, when this statistic starts. According to ISDA, uh, 214 trillion has, was eliminated between uh, 2007 and 2012. So we are talking about very big numbers that are being, and also Dennis was, was referring to this. There are many reasons why uh, uh, this portfolio compression takes place. One clear uh, motivation is actually that this is a required by uh, Article 14 of the Commission Delegated Regulation 149-2013, which basically says that uh, you need to have a valid explanation to the relevant competent authority uh, for concluding that portfolio compression exercise is not appropriate. So you are encouraged by the, by the regulation to do so. There are also private sector or, or individual incentives to do that. As, uh, as clearly you can reduce counterparty risk, operational risk, management of, of all kinds of uh, collaterals, settlements and so forth. And, but there is also important factor which is related to the incentives to shrink the balance sheet for regulatory requirements. The bilateral compression can take place between two mutual agreements between two counterparties and the multilateral compression is, is basically done through an external service provider. Okay. The portfolio compression, just to, to show you what is it all about, you see the two charts here. On the left hand side you see the before compression situation and on the right hand side you see after the compression uh, exercise has taken place. The key here is in this multilateral compression is that this basically happens in this closed intermediation chain. Uh, but the bilateral uh, compression can take place also uh, beyond of this A, B, and C. It could also happen between C and D, for instance. But here, in, when you, we are looking now the multilateral compression, and there you, you basically uh, you are required to, to, to look this intermediation chain. Uh, quickly introducing the concept of notional uh, excess. So basically this intermediation between the dealers leads to a uh, notional excess. It's a concept by a few of my colleagues who are working on a theoretical paper referred here, where basically they show that this uh, excess is part of the cross notional that can be eliminated without changing the net positions. So at the end of the day, the compression uh, is a network operation that reconfigures the web of outstanding trades, uh, so that basically there is a lower excess in the market. So uh, the work by uh, Marco De Rico and Tarek Rogni basically identify different classes of compression. They also uh, look different uh, necessary and sufficient conditions when compression can be applied, what are different methods to do compression, and also what are basically the uh, resulting changes for the network uh, structure. Uh, just very briefly uh, give you some, um, some uh, example how, how we can basically look this uh, compression using EMIR data. So depending basically the level we aggregate uh, trades uh, and the algorithm that you use to, uh, uh, to do compression, we find that roughly 20 to 50 percent of single name CDS notional can be reduced. Uh, naturally, if you uh, include broader set of uh, 
of reference entities that you sort of, for instance, uh, a little bit different timings of the of the uh, uh, of the notionals when they expire, you can enhance this uh, this uh, level of uh, notional that can be reduced. Key point here is that again the ultimate risk sellers and buyers on the left and right are, are not affected, while as the the compression is focusing on the excess between the dealers. So in these charts, we saw basically that the notional excess, so the amount that can be basically in theory reduced, was, was reduced with certain algorithms and certain assumptions uh, uh, by uh, 24%. So one can clearly clearly reduce this, this here. So what are the implications? Um, uh, clearly, uh, the, the, man, the numbers mentioned earlier show that compression is significant and is reshaping to ter together with the central clearing the OTC derivatives at the moment. Uh, generally, uh, we are very, un very much under-researched in this, this area of, uh, of uh, importance. So again, uh, I would encourage uh, people to, to really focus on, on their efforts of of this topic, which is um, indeed quite important. Um, and one factor which is also clear to us when looking at the EMIR data, it's actually not trivial to identify in the current EMIR trading, uh, trade reporting framework, the history of portfolio compression. The private entities that are making the, uh, the portfolio compression are keeping track of the trades and they have the, the, the data. But Using the public reporting, it's not very easy to construct basically the, the history of compression. So, what are the implications um, uh, overall? Um, the cross reduction of notional amounts uh, is is positive, and it may reduce opacity in the time of stress. So, the G20 objectives are being uh, addressed uh, here. Uh, there is also clear positive impact on the reduction of the payments due at the times of stress and also the liquidity needed uh, when, 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 when it's really uh, desired to have. So this, this is a positive factor. However, there are also some, some dimensions that, that would need to be further researched. And clearly one factor is what are the implications for the um, counterparty risk at the times of stress, because we are actually reducing the number of counterparties uh, as we are, we are changing this, uh, this uh, uh, exposure structure. We are potentially concentrating more counterparty risk to, to certain, certain uh, parties. Uh, uh, even potentially more important factor is that we have no yet uh, results whether basically the compression can enhance or reduce network fragilities by altering the network structure. And this is very important to, to highlight that the, the compression that is taking place is between private entities who do not know the whole network of the, of the markets. Actually, uh, there are very few instances who know the global markets. I mentioned DTCC, for instance, has a data uh, globally. But uh, currently, the regulators or the ESRP, for instance, is limited with its access to the European derivatives markets. The, 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 the parties making portfolio compression have even more limited uh, information. They are relying on the information that the counterparties who want to make the compression provide to them. So basically, the compression is done with uh, in a local information and not globally, using global information. And this can have implications for, for net, from the network theory perspective. But would that increase in any, would there be any instance that it increases risk because they do not know the whole picture? So, so, so this is the question that I'm asking. So, so per, basically when, no. no, basically when you are operating in a non-full set of information, you, you, you might end up in a, in a situation which is basically leading to that the network structure is actually less robust than when you would use global information set. So this is one factor which needs to be uh, analyzed more, more in depth. Finally, uh, uh, also things that needs to be looked at is the, basically the macro prudential dimension of, 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 the, of the compression for capital and collateral. I mentioned there are um, private incentives to, to do compression. 
uh, for for instance, to, to reduce um, the, the level of, of, the, of the balance sheet. So we need to understand basically more what could be these type of implications. One final fa uh, fact that I want to emphasize is that there is clearly uh, uh, important further need for uh, uh, regulators to have more transparency of the com uh, portfolio compression methodologies. And also, as I mentioned, on the, on the EMI reporting so that the history of trades can be better con uh, constructed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Very interesting. Uh, with no, much further ado, Professor Pelitzon, if you... Pointer. Pointer. Thank you very much for inviting me to discuss these three, let's say, talks. And thank you for sending me the slides yesterday. So, you know, no my, my yeah, a lot of time. So, the whole night. <laughs> yesterday morning. So, uh, but, you know, I'm, uh, I'm very happy to discuss this topic that is uh, related a lot on what on part of my research. Um, so I'm starting with the first uh, uh, talk, and it's on stop and go, the reform agenda of the OTC derivative markets. And uh, you know, clearly, this, uh, this, I, I find this, uh, this analysis very interesting. The key point that is, it has been stressed is this OTC market structure is inefficient, pretty much. And uh, there is an inefficient risk allocation. You know, my role is just to start to ask questions on this fantastic, let's say, uh, data, because uh, I think that uh, we shouldn't just stop and look to what the data on this market are telling us, but we need to consider also that this is one of the market through which, uh, let's say, uh, firms can hedge their uh, foreign exposure. So, you know, I have several questions and that I've already discussed with Harald uh, a little bit. So what, the first thing is, why are you surprised that in an OTC market there is concentration? Pretty much this is something that we find everywhere and is largely due to this information, let's say, um, so this economy of scale coming mostly from getting information. So this kind of structure is the same that you find in the CDS market, is the same that you find in the uh, OTC market for corporate bonds, sovereign, and so on. So clearly, I think that uh, we need to take it as the result of the market as soon as you have this kind of economy of scale. So the question is, is this is good from the systemic point of view or not? And if we decide that it's not how we can eventually try to change this structure. Um, then I think that on the other side, uh, we need also to seriously ask to us, because this is not, again, related only to the Forex market, but is related to a lot of other OTC market. So why is this uh, structure of the market inefficient? So which is the perspective from which we are saying that is inefficient? Uh, what are the alternatives first? Uh, and, uh, you know, and why, if there is some alternative that has not been uh, implemented? Uh, pretty much what it has been already stressed, maybe there is this, you know, incumbent that are already there and it's very difficult, you know, even if there is this huge amount of money that you can earn, it's very difficult to come in and, uh, you know, maybe change the structure in a different way. But pretty much so far, what we observe is that uh, in many cases, there are many players I have long chat with Deutsche Börse about this, for example, that they try a lot to set up in, a, in several different OTC markets, starting from the Bund market, for example, Bund OTC market, an exchange trade market, and they were never able to do it for several reasons. So I think that we need really to try to analyze deeply why this is impossible. And uh, uh, on the other side, from the inefficient risk allocation, uh, well, I think that we need to be seriously um, conscious that if we are really preventing banks to be at the center of this OTC market, we need to figure out who will be the alternative. So they can be potentially hedge funds, insurances, pension funds. And uh, the question is, uh, is this really the solution that we want? Do they have the capacity? Do they have the ability to do this? Are we eventually creating uh, other systemically important institutions, you know, talking about hedge funds, maybe is a good thing having them uh, doing this business, but we know that they can create also some problem. In the past, we have some examples. So I think that we need to be uh, pretty much, you know, um, 
When we are saying it is too risky to have these 16, let's say, big players in the market to play this role, we need to seriously also address the issue on what is the alternative. And then uh, um, I'm just asking, you know, what regulators should do. Because pretty much what the experience is telling us is that you can impose that all trades are on the exchanges. But the question is, you know, we have already exchanges on the Forex market. You have the exchange trade market for the, the, the uh, let's say, the, the, the spot, and you have the future market. So why we still have an OTC market for the forward contracts, and in some cases also for the spot contracts? Either people that are going to trade, these uh, firms that are trading in the uh, OTC market has no, have no ac access to the exchange trade market. So the question is maybe we are putting too much barriers on these exchange trade markets. Uh, because, you know, otherwise there is, it's not that we are talking about a market where there are no other possibility, like the corporate bond market. We are talking about a market where there are alternatives. So why these companies are not going to trade in the alternative markets. And if they are the exchange trade, they, the only way that you can think to implement to make eventually this market more efficient. Uh, the other alternative that uh, I think regulators should also consider is uh, to have more transparency, as it has been done in the corporate bond market with trades. And uh, maybe this will be enough. Uh, the, this is clearly a question. I don't know if this is true or not, but clearly there are several steps that you can do for these uh, over-the-counter markets to improve their, let's say, efficiency. And one thing, before to move directly to imposing an exchange trade market, that maybe you are just killing this market, is to think to have more transparency. And again, I'm, I'm asking how peculiar is really the Forex market? Because you know, how different is this market microstructure with respect to the exchange Forex market? Maybe even there you have that you have these 16 large players, you know, that are the market makers of this market. So, you know, even in that case, you will have that they are also having all the rents coming from this market. Is this a big issue? Is this a problem? And, uh, uh, you know, again, how different is the distribution of the profit in the future exchange market with respect to this one? It would be nice to have data and to analyze this. And then how is costly, again, uh, to get access to the future Forex market? Because if it is the cost larger than the one paid on the spread for the uh, forward Forex market, well, maybe this is a good reason of not going in this other market seems so efficient. So as you see, I have several questions that I think that will be nice to start to address. Um, and then the other thing is that why technology, you know, uh, didn't reduce these kind of barriers or uh, is not really improving the inefficiency, both in terms of, uh, you know, having these uh, uh, large players playing this big role, and also in terms of, you know, of uh, uh, distributing better risk among the different players in the market. And do we really should care about client and experience? You know, it's not we are talking about householders that maybe they don't have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, experience that we should protect. They are companies. And, you know, uh, is this really so relevant for systemic risk that we are caring about these clients that have uh, inexperience? Uh, you know, the forex market is not such a complicated market. So why do you have these clients that are having this inexperience? Are they really an expert or maybe either they don't have alternatives or there is some, some other reason of why at the end, you know, they are paying this large uh, uh, spread? Now I move to the second talk that I think is very fascinating and uh, is related to uh, clearing uh, CCP and clearing house. And uh, uh, to be honest, I'm largely working also on this uh, topic. I just pick up two things that I think are really, uh, really important, even if I think all the points rise are, uh, you know, well placed. And one is related to without access to the central bank in the relative currency, this result uh, in increased unsecured deposit at commercial banks during a stress event can be, uh, you know, very dangerous. So I think that the big question that you need to ask about the access of the CCP or clearing house to the central bank is, uh, you know, what is their legal status? If, if you're looking around, even in Europe, but also around the world, 
all these, these uh, different cl uh, central clearing have different legal status. The reason why in the US, FDAC is the uh, regulator of uh, CCP and ICE pretty much and the other is because they are legally banks. If, you know, in some other states, this kind of, uh, let's say, institution are not banks, they are not, you know, subject to that kind of regulation, but to something else. So I think that the first question that we need really to ask about this institution is, what should be their optimal legal status? And then, you know, the second question is how they should be regulated and how they should be supervised. Because uh, as it has been already stressed, you know, this kind of institution are subject to completely different, you know, uh, type of regulation from the macro side to the macro perspective. But really, you know, uh, if you are, for example, uh, considered a bank, you will be under the supervision of all the other banks. But on top of this, you have ISMA that is overlooking over you because clearly you are playing a big role in the market. So clearly, I think that we need really to seriously think on how to build up a serious regulation on uh, and supervision of this kind of legal uh, of these institutions. And then I, I would like just to stress another point. More than that, serious uniform, you mean? Sorry? More than serious uniform. Yes, exactly. OK. And uh, uh, in terms of CCP recovery and resolution, clearly this is also another important uh, problem and there are the issue, you know, wh who is the resolution authority and when should be uh, this uh, resolution. Regarding to this, uh, I would like to stress that uh, uh, I just wrote a, a white paper with Jan Kranen on predatory margin in the regulation of supervision of central counterpart cleaning house. And you know, we are really addressing exactly this point on top of the other issue about how to really regulate this uh, uh, central clearing and, and so on. And uh, you know, one of the things that uh, we stress in, the, in this paper is that in line with this robust but fragile property, because I think that really CCP reflect exactly this, uh, this, this uh, position, uh, a CCP triggers a systemic risk event with small but clearly possible probability. We cannot, whatever is the kind of requirement that you're asking, prevent this uh, possibility. And clearly in this case, uh, you know, there is no other way that the government will rescue this. So the answer to the question who are going to pay, we know, will be, there will be a bailout. There is no other way. And uh, the, I, what we stress is that that is not pointed too much, is that uh, uh, we need also to figure out how is the optimal market structure of this CCP. You know, so far we have a strong competition that is going on among at least in Europe, among 16 different central, uh, different six CCP. And clearly we know that uh, when you're competing, there will be, of course, uh, the risk of undermargining by aggressive CCP in order to have the large fraction of the market. And this is clearly having an impact on the level of systemic risk that this kind of institution may eventually create. And then the second thing is also related to transparency. How much transparent is their individual exposure? And if you have a lot of them, clearly you have again a problem about undermargining. So this is also another thing that we think should be stressed and analyzed. So you need really to have an efficient design on one side, we need to figure out how this competition can affect uh, the level of margin that they are going to charge. And then clearly we need to have a proper regulation because if you are allowing them to compete, you need to, re you need to regulate in order to have this undermargining effect. And clearly, the, the best solution is that uh, you should have uh, a supervisory practice that uh, is not as it is now, uh, mostly at the national level, that is, you know, just uh, uh, related to the, 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 uh, where they are located. And clearly, these supervisory standards should be uniformly applied without regard to the local champions. So even at the national level, you shouldn't have big difference between the large and the small one. And then clearly in terms of the regulation and supervision, it should be centralized in one agency, you know, as there is also the hope that this happens in, uh, in, in Europe. And, you know, including all the national, let's say, economies in the CCP counterparty that are clearly do do domiciled. And uh, the set of countries that will clearly ultimately face the bailout should be clearly um, agree on this. And, uh, 
Remember that if we are then agreeing that we have a single supervisor and we are maybe treating them as banks because they are getting access to the central bank, well, the bailing rule that we have in Europe is not working for CCP. So we need to think to something else. Because clearly, you know, this total loss absorbing capacity for sure will be not enough. And uh, clearly, this robust yet fragile nature will clearly, you know, uh, prevent the possibility of having a bail-in that will be enough and you need to have a bailout. So clearly, we need to make sure that uh, you know, the bailout will be not just at the nation where this CCP is located, but uh, you know, we need that uh, all the different, uh, uh, let's say, um, countries that are involved where the CCP are having clients should be clearly uh, considered for, uh, for this. And we know that the bailout clearly is giving a strong incentive for um, adverse selection and moral hazard. This is why we need to have a consolidated supervisor in Europe. Then I'm going to the last uh, topic that is analyzing credit derivative market, flow of risk, uh, national excess, and portfolio compression. And you know, the first thing is that clearly this is a very great, nice database. Every researcher would like to work with this data. And uh, you know, my uh, you know, few months ago, I was in the same room here at the, the statistical uh, conference, and I'm, I was stressing there, as I'm stressing now, that these data should be made available also not only to the supervisor but also to academicians, because you know, the improvement and the kind of analysis that you can do with this data uh, will, you know improve a lot our knowledge on how these markets are working and, and so on. Even if, you know, we know that there are some limits on the data that ESRB are, is having because, you know, it's just only if the reference entity is a European reference entity or one of the two traders is located in Europe, you have this data. So clearly it's very partial. And it's so surprising that we cannot get a global database about this kind of transaction. So the focus is on the flow of risk, uh, runway risk, and portfolio compression. And uh, uh, you know, regarding flow of risk, what they find is that CDS market is highly concentrated on few central dealers, nothing new, you know. And clearly, this is the same result that uh, uh, Getmansky, Girardi, and Lewis find, and they publish this in the Journal Alternative Investment using DTCC data on CDS transaction. Uh, well, you know, here, as the one shown by um, Peltonen, Tuomas, uh, you can see that pretty much you have you know, these 10 big players that are at the center and you have the rest uh, you know, just uh, uh, buying and selling a, a small fraction. Uh, the other thing is that concentration of ultimate risk buyer are hedge funds and asset managers. So clearly, I think that we need to also to ask, so what? It is OK, this is what we want, or this is something that we would like to, to avoid. Uh, so clearly, it will be nice also to have uh, a view from the systemic point of view uh, if this is really what we, uh, we want as a final result of this, uh, uh, of this, let's say, transfer of risk. The, um, the other thing is this wrong way risk. What they find is that pretty much they just show to us two cases, but it doesn't seem that is this large wrong way risk for sovereign risk. But clearly the question is what about financial references? I think that there is really where we have wrong way risk. And again, from the paper of uh, Getmansky, Girardi, and Lewis, what you get is this table, for example, where you can see that really, you know, there is a huge amount of wrong way risk uh, among the different is these uh, 10 institutions. So pretty much one fifth of, uh, uh, of the total amount is really, you know, uh, there. And uh, about portfolio compression, I think that it's very interesting and important that we are thinking about portfolio compression, how to, you know, to eliminate or reduce this counterparty risk and so on. But clearly, if we're going on the direction of the having uh, contract, OTC contract clear, well, directly you will have uh, uh, this portfolio compression because you know this will be really what at the end the clearing house are doing so uh, what they get is that you can really improve a lot the uh, the level of uh, uh, let's say the amount of risk that the, it has been compressed by looking to the data that they have 
But, uh, you know, it will be pretty much the same or even less. Uh, you, will, you can have more by clearance. And, uh, you know, what I'm going to present you is really what you can get by uh, using, in this case, this is a work that I'm doing with SEC, with Giulio Gerardi and uh, Mario Bellia, that is one of my PhD students here. Uh, this is a work that I'm doing uh, on DTCC data on uh, CDS. So the question was, uh, is uh, to clear or not to clear? And unfortunately, I can show to you only one slide about this. But pretty much what we find is that uh, even if it is not compulsory in the US that you have to clear your transaction, at the end, you know, they, they do. So more than 80% of the transaction that can be cleared because the, the, they'll say the dealer is member of the, of the clearing house or because the reference entity is accepted by the clearing house or because the characteristic of the contract, you know, is really in line. So this means that you don't even need to impose it. As soon as you give the possibility, it seems that now the market is really, you know, reacting in a good shape. And the decision to clear balance the cost of the CCP margin against the additional capital requirement that clearly you will have because you are not clearing. And we do find that, you know, really, they, the, the, the decision to clear do react to the incentive that the regulator are providing. So, you know, uh, you have that the ones that are clear are the safer and more liquid. They tend to flatter exposure with the CCP in order, so they clear only if really they have a reduction in the margin requirements. And usually, you know, you are clearing because the counterpart is more risky. But what is coming out is that pretty much less than half of the dealer-to-dealer -dealer CDS trade notional value qualify for clearing. So even if you will impose to clear, at the end you will have that only a small fraction of them can be clear because we have this issue about the non-standard contract. So the issue is either we need to try to accept more non-standard contract, and this is a question for uh, uh, LCH, how really to improve the amount of content that can be clear. And, uh, you know, uh, because it seems really that uh, the market is already reacting on this re direction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, I remind that we are already running out of time. It's going to be lunch. So every minute that we take now is taken away from lunch, right? <laughs> Uh, authors, please. <laughs> Just a very if I don't want to comment the, the many interesting questions that Loyana posed, but just two remarks. First is, uh, I happened to read Angus Deaton's Nobel Prize speech in Sweden last, I think, November it happened, and he made a very simple point that all good policy starts with good data or with better data. So I think what he said about development economics equally applies to financial economics. We have the unique chance here with the ME data to elevate, I think, the policy debate to a new level, and we should make as much use of it as possible and, and have a more informed policy debate on many of these regulatory issues. Secondly, and I think Loriana is very, very right on this, we have to make sure that we bring in as much human capital into this debate as possible, meaning a lot of uh, finance researcher that can very productively use this data. And so there must be some, found some way of broadening the participation in the research agenda here by giving access to data like the Bundesbank does. And I think that's also very, very important. Good. Yeah, I'll just, just react to one. It's going to come. It will come. OK, I'll just react to one uh, question about the, um, the level of margins and the, um, if you like, the motivation to lower margin, sort of a predatory margining regime between different CCPs. <clears throat> uh, we had an example, a big example, a few years ago where the, obviously the interest rate environments have fallen. We've heard enough about that today. But the impact on CCPs was pretty dramatic because um, the old relative return way of calculating margins, the distribution of margins using relative returns, was giving uh, margins that were far too low. And um, many, many people in the market were just as upset about it as I was. And we moved to an absolute return distribution way of calculating margins and resetting them. The consequences were that the margins on the swap clear service, which is the big one that I was talking about, doubled. And the interesting thing was, from a commercial perspective, you would have expected that would have been basically suicide. 
But in actual fact, our market share increased dramatically from then on. So the members were also just as concerned about the relative levels of margining between them as we were. So I think that effect shouldn't be missed. Okay. Um, as I also like eating, I will be very brief. Uh, let, me, let me thank Loriana for her comments. Um, actually, the key difference between our analysis with the global DTCC data is that it's a global and not the US. So we, 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 but it's confirming the, the same type of results. Regarding the, I like actually the attitude of so what? So this is the, the way that researchers should operate, so they should ask so what? So basically, regarding the um, ultimate risk buyers being hedge funds or asset managers, so what? Actually, I, I think risk sharing is very important and is, is, is fundamental piece, and it was related to what also you mentioned to Harald, that it's ne not necessarily good that every ri all risk is concentrated in the C16, so having a Risk sharing is very important. Why we do this is we need to basically map who is exposed to what risk when basically the, the risk materializes. And uh, therefore, it's also important to know what are the entities exposed to this. Uh, and it's also important to know that these entities who are exposed to risk are prudentially supervised. So this is one important factor. The second point is that um, on the wrong way risk for banks, this is actually something that we are working on, clearly a very good uh, suggestion. Uh, and regarding the compression, as I mentioned, there is clearly positive aspects, less notional, less opacity, and so forth, less liquidity needed. However, we don't know yet all potential issues, and that's what I was raising. So we need to work more on potential risks rising from this as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we do not have time for, for questions from the audience, so if anybody has questions through the authors, you could approach them during the break, but unfortunately, we need to cut the time for that. I'm very sorry for this. We have a very dense uh, program, uh, which will continue in the afternoon. Uh, as to the location of the lunch, it is <clears throat> exactly in the same place where it was the dinner yesterday. For those who were not there, we have to go back to the entrance and then turn to the left. And then when you will arrive at the security doors, my colleagues will uh, help you. To pass the security doors, you need the badge. And then we will have to go to the end front of the Grossmarkthalle.